I felt like it's important for people to know that no matter how bad it gets, no matter how big your mistakes are, that there is hope, that it doesn't have to define you for the rest of your life. It doesn't have to determine what your future looks like. Hey there, Mama. Welcome to the Marvelous Moms Club podcast. I'm Kirsten Tyrell, and I am the host of this awesome podcast where I get to sit down with moms from all over the world from various walks of life to share their stories of inspiration, knowledge, and all kinds of good stuff to remind you what a truly marvelous mom you are. So sit back and relax or plug your headphones in and keep doing whatever you're doing and enjoy today's episode of the Marvelous Moms Club. Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's episode. I'm chatting with yet another Wendy. I love that there's so many Wendy's involved with the Success Through Failing Project. But today, it's Wendy Sterling Gardner. And she has quite an intense and very interesting story to tell. I don't know how intense we'll get here on this little podcast interview, but you guys will definitely have to get the book so you can read her full chapter because she's got lots to share. And she is going to share as much as she can here with you guys today. So welcome to the podcast, Wendy. Thank you. So fun to chat with you. She's such a beautiful lady sitting across from me today. It's so fun. (laughs) I love what I do, being able to see all these smiling faces, willing to come and bear all. Yes. (laughs) I truly know. It's probably really scary. I've been on the other end of this before, and it's like you don't have as much control. You're just like, what are they going to ask? What are they going to say? It's so scary. So we'll keep it. A little nervous. We'll keep it as as non-scary as possible. (laughs) So first of all, tell everybody about how many kids you have and mommy life. Mommy life. Gosh. Okay. So I have five kids total. I have two um, of my own and three bonus kids. I love that Um, bonus kids. I've been hearing that lately. That's awesome. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Mommy life is, is interesting trying to balance work and family and all the different responsibilities that come along with both of those. And so I think it's a, it's a daily challenge of trying to figure out how to, how to do it all and do it all well. Right. So how old are your kids that live with you? Uh, My two live with us full time and my youngest is 10 and my oldest is 17. He's wow. a senior and graduating this year. Oh, my so goodness. Old. <laughs> you're not old. You're not old. You've got a long Seriously, time until you're old. Seriously, I feel old enough to have a child graduating from high school. It's kind of freaking me out. <laughs> I still don't feel old enough to be a mom. Like, I still think, did my mom, like, it's so weird. You know, you still have your memories of your own parents when you're a child. And you're like, did they have it figured out? Because I really thought they did. And now I'm like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. They probably didn't Yeah. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Such a weird feeling to keep being the grown up when you're going to like parent teacher conference and you're the parent and you're like, what? Right, in fact. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. So that's fun. That's awesome that you've got, you know, the older set of children going on your past the baby phase. But you've had a really interesting kind of rocky background. So dive in wherever you want to start and just start oh, telling gosh. us a little bit about, first of all, maybe tell us about your business and what you do and what you've done. Uh, Well, I have two businesses. I own a real estate brokerage company. I've been in real estate for about 10 years. Uh, My mother before me has been doing this for about 30 years. Wow, runs in the blood. So, you know, found myself a single mom and trying to figure out what I can do to be a mom and work and provide for my family. And and I'd I'd gone to college and was looking at being a counselor, but it just didn't pay enough. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I didn't have the flexibility that I needed. I had one child and found myself with another one on the way. So... Yeah. Um, that the decision to do that is definitely not one that I regret. Um, I love my work in real estate. Um, there, there's just a magic to helping people create, you know, a home Mm -hmm. that that's going to serve their family and create memories with their little ones for years to come. That's pretty neat. Yeah. That is kind of fun to be part of. I love that. Yeah. It's great that it was flexible for you. Yeah, absolutely. There's, I don't, I can't think of anything else that would give me the, the opportunity to be able to show up for field trips and parent teacher conferences and, and, you know, soccer games and things like that. Yeah. So, cool. so I love, I love it. And then, you know, the other piece of that is taking the, the journey that I have had and the troubles that I have seen throughout my interesting life <laughs> and, um, <laughs> finding a way to use those to help people who are going through similar circumstances. And so that's the other piece of it. And, and that also offers flexibility and, and way more emotional gratification than the real estate does. 
Okay, so speaking of your story and kind of how that's played a role in it, I know that there's so much to it and there's so much that you can share. So share as much as you want and maybe where was the pivotal moment? Where would you say like your story begins as far as all the everything all the all the baggage yeah all the guck <laughs> yeah. well I think it ultimately it begins very early on in life and um I didn't find out till much later sorry I'm a crier it's okay so. I'm a crier too <laughs> I'm prepared right tissues <laughs> um so I didn't find out until um actually just a couple of years ago but early on in life I was diagnosed with ODD, which is Oppositional Defiant Disorder. Which is, explain that a little bit. I've never heard of that. Um, it is a mental health disorder, kind of one of those where they don't know what causes it, where it comes from. Um, you know, I, I grew up in a family with two parents who, you know, told me they loved me. And, you know, so the why is still kind of a question mark, mm -hmm. but oppositional deviant disorder is, it's kind of like a raging storm inside you mm -hmm. from a very young age. Um, a combination of anger and depression. Okay. And so, you know, the kids who act out on a huge scale and just seem to have an uncontrollable rage for no apparent reason. Okay. And that was, Aww. and that was, so for a very young age, um, I had all of this stuff going on inside me that I didn't understand, um, couldn't make any sense of as a child. I didn't know even how to put words to it, mm -hmm. let alone how to cope with it. I remember, um, and, and unfortunately, I don't, I don't have a whole lot of memories from my childhood. I think as a result of this, but one distinct memory was Christmas time. And we were all sitting around uh, the Christmas tree and music playing and presents under the tree. And, and we didn't have a lot as a kid, but we never went without. And there was always some presents under the tree. And I just remember feeling like a stranger. And I was probably eight years old. Wow. And, and I remember the very distinct feeling of being... Uh, apart from kind of like sitting on the outside looking in, even though I was in the same room with them, mm -hmm. I, I wasn't one of them. Mm -hmm. And um, so that uh, emotional connections were very hard. Um, knowing and understanding what I was feeling was very hard. So as I continued to grow up, it only progressed worse and worse. And, and um, you know, I think with, as with many things, you know, you turn to substances to, to medicate and try mm -hmm. to fix on the outside what's going on on the inside. Mm -hmm. So from a very young age, I started experimenting with drugs and alcohol and led to, um, you know, as an adult, being a, a drug addict. And, you know, different phases of it. And, you know, by my early 20s, I was a raging meth addict. Oh, my goodness. I would never know that with you sitting in here now. Wow. Right. Raging meth addict, um, living on the streets, homeless, bouncing from drug house to drug house. And, you know, not knowing where my next meal was going to come from. And... Um, and that, that's a pretty, it's a, it's a pretty low place to be. Yeah. That's probably one of the lowest, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Really. I, like the one, one of the lowest you can put yourself in aside yeah. from, you know, things that just kind of happen, you have no control over, but that's got to be the lowest. Wow. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so how, where did you begin to climb out of that? What happened? What was the moment that it changed? Uh, well, there, there was just kind of a series of rock, you know, when people think, you know, that you have to hit rock bottom, they see that as a single event. Right. And I don't think it is. Right. At least not always, not mm -hmm. for me. It was kind of a, a series of things that, that happened that kind of creates the desire to change. And, you know, kind of an old adage in, in recovery is people won't, 
change until staying the same becomes more uncomfortable than the pro the discomfort of the process of change. Right. Uh, you know, because change isn't fun and isn't it isn't easy and it's not comfortable. No. Uh, so a lot of times we avoid that, and until your current reality becomes more uncomfortable than what the change will will be, yeah, you stay put. And so, um, you know, there was a series of really difficult times for me. I go into just one of those in my chapter. Um, you know, there's only so many things you can pack right. into one chapter. It's true. Um, I've had a hard time with that. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, I, I debated for weeks on uh, what to focus on for my chapter. Unfortunately, there's a lot mm -hmm. <laughs> that I had to choose from. Yeah. I, you know, looking back, I wish I didn't have so much material, but, but I do. And, um, <laughs> Not the and best so, blessing, right? <laughs> not no, the, no. Not the greatest thing to have to choose from. <laughs> right. Uh, but so, so for weeks, I kind of toyed with, and and I think as we tend to do as human beings, I sort of started really superficially and and tried to, you know, throw in some frou-frou stuff and some big words and, yeah. and make an impression. And there came a day when I just felt truly... Um, inspired. I felt prompted that I just needed to go deep. Yeah. And, and so it gets very, very deep, very raw to one of the, the worst experiences of my life when, um, you know, when I was in my addiction and I discovered that I was pregnant. Wow. Um, it was a couple of months before, you know, you, when you're, constantly using you're in this sort of a haze I guess and you're not really paying attention to what your body's telling you but the day came that I fi it finally dawned on me you know you start putting all the the pieces together mm -hmm. <clears throat> with the morning sickness and the cravings and <clears throat> excuse me and all those things that go along with it and all of a sudden the thought it had occurred to me oh my gosh am I could I be pregnant? <laughs> Wow. And so I took a pregnancy test and then I took another five. Um, <laughs> of course. <laughs> because surely the first four were wrong. <laughs> right. <laughs> and um, so when I confirmed that, yes, I was pregnant, you know, I knew that I had to to clean up and that was difficult. You know, I, I didn't I didn't know anything about treatment programs. Mm -hmm. um, so I but I knew that that I was pregnant and I couldn't keep using. So I, I did clean up for a period of time for the rest of my pregnancy and for six months while I was nursing. Um, That's crazy that if you were that addicted that you had the self-control. I don't, I don't know a whole lot about drug addiction, but it just seems like when you're in it, you're in it and there's just no way out. But you were able to, like that was enough to keep you it, away for that period of time. For that period of time it was. Um, oh. And I, I think the maternal instinct is mm -hmm. so very strong, that which drives us as a mother to do everything it takes to be a mom and to, you know, sacrifice our own needs for the sake of our children, balancing work and mom, um, yeah. you know, it, you know, protecting your children when something goes wrong. Um, you know, so that maternal instinct was very strong. And I think that was enough, barely, um, to get me by for that short period of time. Yeah. Uh, but as soon as I had nursed him for six months and, you know, those voices in your head start talking to you and, uh, you know, just a little bit, just, to, you know, because I'd gained a significant amount of weight. The combination of coming off of meth and a pregnancy compounded, you know, I gained almost 100 pounds. Wow. And, um, you know, when your self-worth is based off of so many superficial things and, and you haven't done that work mm -hmm. within yourself to truly find the worth and the beauty and and who you are and the knowledge and um, the foundation of who you are as, as a human being. It's all kind of floating out here. And so yeah. those voices became very powerful. Wow. And, and, um, and so I began using again, you know, under the, under the the lie that I told myself that that you know I just use a little bit just to curb my appetite, just to lose a little bit of weight. Um, but as an addict, there's no such thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Especially with a drug like meth. So it it just 
flared up again. And within a very short time period of time, um, I was using again all the time. And, um, and so the difference now was I had this little baby Mm -hmm. and, um, so that's what I go into in uh, my chapter was experiencing this dual force of this, this drug addiction and then this love for my child. And, um, and unfortunately, the addiction won. And when my baby was 10 months old, um, my family had obviously caught on to the fact that I was using again and they stepped in with the courts and took custody. So being an addict is bad enough, but being a drug addict and having your child taken from you is about as low as it can get. Mm -hmm. So that's what I go into in my chapter in the book. Wow. And um, it, it was not, not an easy chapter to write. But um, I felt like it's important for people to know that no matter how bad it gets, no matter how big your mistakes are, that there is hope, that it doesn't have to define you for the rest of your life. It doesn't have to determine what your future looks like. Mm -hmm. Because I know that there's a lot of women out there who have a lot of guilt and a lot of shame over mistakes that they've made and failures in their life. And that's why I love the title of our book, Success Through Failing, finding your greatest gifts in your darkest hours, Mm -hmm. because um, truly things got very, very dark for me. Right. But that didn't have to be the end of my story. And And so that's why I just share that. (laughs) So glad it's not. I mean, it's, it's just crazy because I don't know. I, like I said, I don't know a whole lot about drug addiction, but it just kind of seems like once that's your life, that's it. And it's so, seems like such a daunting task to overcome. So to see you sitting here now, like totally clean, totally happy years later and able to share this in a store, like in a book is yeah. really mind blowing to me. And it really puts in perspective, <laughs> like the full scope of failure, you know, it's not just like mm-hmm. making little mistakes or failing at a business. It's like, wow, <laughs> that was a fail. <laughs> Failed in my whole like life fail. <laughs> yeah, totally. But it did not define who you are now. And it does not mean that you're not capable of success. And look at all the successes you've had since. So we'll we'll bounce from the negative, sad stuff into the right. happiness and seeing where you are now and how that's changed the person you are and how you're using that for good. So how are you using that for good and to help others? I... It's so strange because... It, even even in the very beginning when I first started to get into treatment and go through the process process of recovery which which is not short I laugh when when people go through these 30 day rehabs <laughs> like it's like 30 years <laughs> and, and you know and that's a great start um, but it's such a lifelong process and so for the last 16 years that's the journey that I've been on and um, And there's so much that you learn along the way. And I I remember very distinctly feeling, even at the very beginning when I first got sober, had the impression that, you know, in addition to my own story, that perhaps the the trials that I was going through and the struggles that I was having, that that perhaps it wasn't just about me. Right. And that there would come a time when I would, would be able to use that to help other people. And I just didn't know what that would look like for a very long time. And I, you know, continued on my journey in life and, you know, school and family and business and work and paying your bills and, and all of that kind of um, took a front seat for a really long time. Right. Well, and, it needed and, to. You had <laughs> taken care of yourself for such a long time. And now that really had to become your new norm, right? Like, yeah, the boring yeah. mundane things that we all hate really was like so important for you to master after it, going it really through was. that. And um, so several years after um, after I got clean and went through treatment, um, my my first attempt at you know using my struggles to help other people, I decided that I wanted to be a substance abuse counselor. So I um, went up to the University of Utah. I'd been going to call it uh, taking other you know going to Salt Lake Community College, thinking that I wanted to do human resources. And then that little voice in your head says, nope, <laughs> that's not your journey. 
we have something else in store for you. And so um, I transferred up to the University of Utah and completed their program, did um, an internship, what they call a practicum, at um, an outpatient treatment facility. And, and I loved it. I loved the work. But that was the point where it became very apparent that um, being a drug counselor was not going to pay the bills. Right. Unfortunately. <laughs> um, yeah. And right around that time, uh, baby number two came along, uh, who's my youngest, who's now 10. And um, so that's when I kind of diverted into my career in real estate and sort of left that on the back burner uh, until a short time ago when I started realizing that one does not have to exclude the other yeah. and just feel really feeling moved like now's the time. Mm-hmm. And again, that same voice started talking to me and saying, you know, here's what you need to do and here's why you need to do it. And so I made the decision to um, start taking action towards uh, making that a reality. Wow. And and so now um, I get to do both. I love that. <laughs> so Two different capes that I wear, um, <laughs> and it's great. Um, and so, you know, now what that looks like is coaching and mentoring um, people who are both in the initial phases of, am I ready to go to treatment? Mm-hmm. Am I ready to get help, but I'm scared? Yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do that. Um you know, everything from, you know, hardcore meth addicts like I was to moms who found themselves hooked on pills. Right. Um, and, um, you know, to people who have gone through treatment and have recently completed treatment. And what next? Right. You know, how, how do I figure out where I fit into life? Because, you know, um, the world doesn't stop turning mm-hmm. when you're in treatment and when you're trying to... Um, overcome an addiction and life continues to work and, and life issues and life problems. You know, the electric bill still has to get paid. You know, your, right. your kids still need you. And so figuring out what that looks like for everyday life and trying to integrate, you know, the new you because treatment from an addiction, you're almost um, creating an, a new version of yourself. Mm-hmm. And and that's the beauty of it. And that's what I love it is that you get to kind of wipe the slate clean, figure out who you want to be and, and what that person looks like. But then you have to integrate that new person into your old life, um, right. depending on where that looks like. And there, there's a whole spectrum. And um, so so that's one thing that I like doing is helping people figure out how to integrate uh, what they've learned in treatment into their life and make it practical and in the practical application of that and then families who you know maybe they're they are you know they still have a loved one who's active in their addiction and and just don't really know how to cope with that or who's in treatment or who's in the court system incarcerated going to to face charges or um, someone who's recently come out of treatment Mm -hmm. and that looks different for the family member as it does for the addict. And so, and I've, I've actually lived on both, both sides of that spectrum. Um, in my recovery wound up, um, in a relation with my youngest father, um, who, who went back to an an addiction, um, and started using again. And so I got to live for a couple of years as that family member. (laughs) That is crazy that you didn't fall back into your addiction. I mean, was that hard because it's there? Oh my gosh. Talk about willpower. Extremely challenging. <laughs> wow. Wow. So, um, you know, and, and that's why it's a process because I, I, yeah. I didn't do it perfectly. You know, um, I did have a lot of principles that I learned uh, through my own treatment that I was able to, you know, I wish that I just dove in and been a superstar at the very beginning. <laughs> um, but un- unfortunately, it took me several years. Um, to get through that process and and learn more lessons along the way. Mm -hmm. Um, But but it gave me a perspective that I think is very useful for me now and what it looks like to be on the other side of the fence. Yeah, wow. Well, I'm so grateful that all that messy stuff that you had to go through and that happened to you is now something that you're using to help other people. There's nothing more noble than that because I'm sure it's not always comfortable to revisit those feelings or be around people who are going through that. It Mm -hmm. has to surface a lot of your own memories and your own feelings of when you were going through it for sure. 
So, but to be able to still do that and, and make, literally make the world a better place by helping other people come out of that dark space yeah. is something so amazing. And so I think, I think you're amazing. I think you're truly oh. marvelous. <laughs> <laughs> Jazz hands. Yes, that's me. Um, but really, the, the thank you so much for sharing that here on the podcast. I really look forward to reading the, the darkest, most vulnerable parts of your story and preparing with my box of tissues, which I'll probably need to read the entire book, but really particularly so. yours. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Amazing, amazing stuff. Thank you so much, Wendy. You're such an inspiration. And I, I will link to everything you in the show notes so people can keep up with you and check awesome. out your, the things that you offer with your business and follow along with your story. So thank you again for sharing. Um, I really You're very appreciate welcome. it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no problem. <laughs> Good. And to the rest of you guys listening, have a marvelous day and we'll see you on the next episode. If you want to come and hear myself and some of the other authors from Success Through Failing speak and share even more of our stories, come to the summit on February 4th in Sandy, Utah. To get your ticket, go to summit.successthroughfailing.com. And if you're unable to attend in person, you can also live stream it. Head over there right now and get your ticket and I will see you at the conference.